Good morning, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr. And welcome back to my podcast. Darling, I'm depressed again. Don't tell my mother. Where we discuss mental health in the youth, the adolescents, the teenagers, the elderly, the middle-aged, those in the midlife crisis stage. Listen, we have something for college students, high school students, tertiary school students, from trade school to university level. Once you are a human being, once you are breathing, we have something for you. And before we get into the episode, I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to everyone who has listened, who has streamed these episodes from Spotify to YouTube to Apple Music, Amazon. Listen, all of you have done such a wonderful job. I am so touched. This is our season finale, and I could not be more grateful for such a wonderful audience. From your questions to the comments that you guys leave when you reach out, it's all just Thank you all so, so, I'm so, so grateful for y'all. I thank God for y'all, and I thank y'all for what y'all have done. And don't worry, we're going to be coming back with more episodes, so don't worry, okay? Now, each episode, I like to give a certain word that ties into the theme of the episode. And the word for this episode is acceptance. Acceptance. Now, it's like trigger warning, we're going to be discussing sicknesses, we're going to be discussing cancer, we're going to be discussing depression, things of that nature. So if you are squeamish by squeamish around those things, if those type of things make you uncomfortable, I'm just giving you a bit of a pre-warning before we get into it. All right, now if you couldn't tell by the title, darling, why did you have to say goodbye? This episode can be a little sad, it can be a little sad, you know, get your little tissue or whatever, but <laughs> um, it's going to be it's going to be something that I have difficulty talking about, even to this day. So let's get into it. My Annie Magdalene, my Annie Magdalene, growing up, was one of the people who shaped my life. From I could, from I started reading. From I started writing, from I started doing anything involving the arts or anything involving me expressing myself, she supported me 100%. My first speech competition, I won it. And when I had to redo the speech in front of a whole crowd, she was sitting right there in the crowd next to my sister. And she was right there cheering me on. And I spoke about my dreams. I said, I can't, for I can, I will, and I shall do it. Thank you. And she was so proud of me on everything that I did, everything that I wanted for myself, everything that I tried to be. She encouraged it with the grace and the love of God. That's what she did for me. And for many years, my aunt was, a, she was a building block in my life. Like she was a, a piece of my foundation. You know, God is the root of all things, and he gives you these amazing individuals who help you, who nurture you, who guide you and strengthen you, and who bless your life by their presence. And my Aunt Magdalene, my Annie, my Annie was one of them. She was one of them. Now, my aunt suffered an accident, from an accident, while on the job, and you know, for a while, I thought things were okay. You know, she say she felt that there was an incident, but back pain is normal. You know, back pain is, yeah, she cool, she straight, she good. All do people get back pain all the time. I mean, this was my mommy younger, my mommy's younger sister, but she still was like, you know, up there in age. Like, she is also, all the people get back pain all the time. Like, you know, my older friends who like in their 20s who, you know, Doing that thing, they they all that stuff, and you also don't start expecting back pain. You know that's what you're getting, right? Because <laughs> you're older. And then it started getting worse. I realized that she couldn't move without feeling all this pain. She couldn't be mobile without wincing. I said, "Hmm, I know." like a loss of flexibility as you age can become a, you know, it can become a thing, but 
that didn't seem normal. And then one day, we went to the hospital. And for the first time in my life, I saw my auntie. My auntie who was always hugging people and who was always kissing people and blessing people and loving people. My auntie who was one of the most beautiful people I know, who was mobile, who walked to the bus stop every day and would walk back if she didn't get a ride. For the first time in my life, I saw my auntie in a wheelchair. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what was wrong. Because to see someone that had been a pillar of strength for me my entire life, to see someone that God had placed to help uphold me and guide me in that condition, because of this great pain, I didn't know what was going on. So push comes to shove, shove comes to push. We find out that she has multiple myeloma, a form of cancer that develops within the bones. And I was devastated. I was devastated. Because for one thing, you never imagine that your family members are going to get cancer. You never imagine that someone close to you could get cancer. You never imagine it. No one wants to imagine that. No one wants to picture that. No one wants to see that image in their head. Because immediately when your mind goes to cancer, it goes to, oh my God, this person might die. That's where my mind went at that age, all those years ago. I went to, oh my gosh, my auntie might die. But my auntie, she was a prayer woman. Listen, let me tell you something. She was a prayer. This woman would pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And she prayed and she had the most faith and the most trust in God. And I believe that's part of where I get mine from too. Because I would watch her even in the most adverse conditions. Even before she got sick. When she experienced times of difficulties. She relied on God in the most extraordinary and miraculous and wonderful ways. And he always came through. Right? God always came through. So I said in my head, what are I worrying about? I don't see, I am seeing God. Listen, she has prayed for a ride. And I, see, I saw God give her a ride. Trust me, this is not, this is nothing, right? This is nothing. As the weeks go on, I realize that she can't get out of bed. Someone that I had loved my whole life. And I watched her move and maneuver herself and be there for everyone. She couldn't get out of bed. I didn't know in that moment. I, I, I was holding on. I was saying in that moment, okay, you know what? Maybe God is God is allowing her to get to the edge so, you know, we can make a comeback. Like, we can make a comeback. Like, we can do this. Like, it's going to be okay. The cancer is going to come out of you. Like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be perfect. You're going to be great. You're going to be okay, Annie. You could be okay. After that, after the weeks that followed, I realized that it started getting worse because my Annie didn't really... She wasn't, she didn't want to accept the fact of what was happening to her for, for, for good reason. No one wants to have cancer. No one wants to be sick. No one wants that for themselves. And so her, it was to her, it was just, I'll be fine. I'll be okay. It's okay. I'll be good. And one day, because I was trying to get her to sit up, we were, she wanted me to try to help her sit up. And I was trying to help her. And she began to cry. She began to cry. And it broke my heart in ways I could never. I 
explain it. It was devastating to me. It was devastating. To see someone who had been there for everyone their entire lives, who was there for everyone, who was always there for everyone, to see her to a point where she couldn't be there for herself. It broke my heart. But you know what? I said, God, I know you still could do something. You still could work a miracle. You still could save a life. There is nothing too impossible for you. People have come back from stage four. People have come back from the worst sicknesses alive. People have been devastated and hurt and almost obliterated by completely terrible illnesses. God, I know you can do this. I like I I I like I had the most faith in the world. I had the most hope in the world. That my aunt would survive this. And my prayer was, please heal a God. Please heal my Yanni. That was my prayer. I didn't want to see her in pain. I didn't want to see her hurting. I didn't want to see her damaged. I didn't want to see her feeling these things. My prayer was, God, please, 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 please do something. God, I need you to do something. I can't, I, I just need you to heal her. Please, God, heal her, heal her, heal her, heal her, heal her. And my aunt fought so hard for her life. She fought so hard. She fought so hard that people would be in wonder. Some people would come to visit her and they would say, Oh my gosh. God can heal you, Maggie. God can, God can do it. And in a way, they were right. He did heal her. Just not in the way we expected. So one day, I uh, we have to go to the hospital. My aunt had to get an ambulance from her house to the hospital because she had something. There was something going on in her brain, and it basically she had a stroke, I believe. So we went to the hospital. We went to the hospital. And this is one of the things I'll never forget as long as I live. I looked at my Annie and she asked me, Who you is? She asked me who I was. And I couldn't. When I get in the car, I start breaking down. My mommy had to call my Annie Deli. My Annie Deli was like, JJ, calm down, calm down, calm down. But <laughs> when she asked me who I was, I said, Annie, this JJ, Annie, this JJ, yeah, you know me. I love you. And it was at that moment that I realized it was, it, it began to become real for me that she, there's a possibility that the healing that I was praying for, that we had been praying for, might not be on the physical realm. Because when she asked me that question, when she asked me who I was, I felt as if the years of love and the years of guidance and the years of adoration and trust that she had given me, I felt that it had been erased. So I didn't know in that moment if I was talking to my auntie or a stranger. I didn't know. And that was one of the last times that I spoke to her. That was the last time, actually, that I spoke to her while she was alive because the next time that I visited her she was unresponsive and it's difficult for me to talk about because I never I never imagined it no one can imagine it no one can p 
picture the amount of hurt and pain it takes. It 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 is to see someone that you love in that position until it actually happens. Because a piece of me died that day. A piece of me definitely died. Um, when she asked me who I was, and I wasn't sure if I would ever get it back. And I still haven't, so <laughs> that goes to show. But yes, that was the last time that I spoke to her. While she was, when she was alive, well, the last time that we spoke, when she was alive, the next time I went to visit her, she was unresponsive, and I kept telling her I loved her. I kept saying, I love you, honey, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I prayed to God that somehow, some way, she could hear me. Somehow, some way. But I still had hope. I still had hope. So, boom, here we are, a week before my birthday. Like around a week before my birthday. How many days in January? Less than a week before my birthday. January 25th, we get a call from the hospital saying we need to come. Now, my mother begins to panic, and I, I start getting panicking because, like, what does that mean? Maybe that means that she's improving. Maybe that means that she's okay. Maybe that means that everything's going to be fine. Maybe that's what that means. January 25th, I believe at 8.10, I believe at 8.10, my aunt transitioned from this world. She passed away. And it was not. I got there and all of my hopes and my faith was lying underneath a white sheet. And watching them roll her body away is a, it's a memory I'll never really forget because I could almost feel I could almost feel the love and everything that she had given the world, I could almost feel it being pushed out of the room behind her body. So we get to the car afterwards, and I'm crying. And my daddy was like, JJ, you still have to pray? I was like, Daddy, I don't want to hear no prayer right now. He tell me, stop it, stop it. You still have to pray. And like in my head, I was like, God, why? And I know people will be like, don't question God, don't question... I definitely said God why. No, I said God why for real. I said God why. Because I did not understand how a person of such love, of such faith, of such hope could die this way. I didn't understand it. I did not understand it. She had loved God my entire life for as from before I lived, from before my older sister lived. She had loved God. She had served him faithfully and she had done all of these things and she had been in the church and she was kind and she practiced obedience in the spirit and she was loving. So God, why is she dead? Why is she dead? God, why have you done this to me? That was my thought process. Why have you done this to us? Why does she need to experience the pain that she experienced? Why does she need to go through what she went through? I became angry with God. I became angry with God. And it wasn't until later that I understood that when I prayed for healing, when we prayed for healing, there's, there are situations where the healing is better given on a different realm of existence. The healing is better in the heavenly realm at times. And I didn't understand it then, but God had answered the prayer. She had been healed. 
So when it came down to my Annie Magdalene's death, I I understood that God healed her in the way that he thought was best. And it took me a while to understand that, but I got it. But that still didn't help me with the grief part of it. Because I was trying to go back to the person that I was before she died. So I was trying to be the JJ that I was before my Annie died. So I was trying to be everything that I knew I could be emotionally, mentally, no, I was spiritually, I was trying to be that person, but it's a realization that occurred. It's a realization that occurs when you understand the fact that we can't go back to the person that we were before we lose someone. Because that person no longer exists. That person is no longer present. We are now a new person who has to live their life without the influence and the current guidance of that person. So for me, it was like, I can't be the JJ who are the Ani no more. Now I got to be the JJ who refers to as Ani in the past tense. And that was the most difficult thing for me because I didn't want to do that. Like, it was it was so heart wrenching for me. I couldn't bear the idea of talking about my auntie in the past, but oh my lord! It listen talking about someone that you used to talk about in the present tense. It's in the past tense. It's not easy. Like going from saying is to was, going from saying they are to they were. That will freak you right up i would know because when i had to do that for my auntie it was like bro no way no way because she should still be here she should still be here like and that was the grief process and i think for a lot of christians for a lot of us we undermine the grief process because we don't want to seem as if we are disrespecting god we don't want to ask God why. We don't want to express our anger, our feelings, our emotions towards God. And that becomes dangerous because when we hold those feelings in, we end up building up resentment towards God. We end up building resentment because we won't ask God why. We won't ask him how he could do this. We don't say those things sometimes. So we just, we just keep it on the inside. Because we think that in our beliefs, we have to be entirely silent. That we just, we trust, of course, we trust that God knows what's best and we do that. But we don't believe that anger should be a part of the stages of grief. A lot of us don't. We don't believe that we should feel that anger that comes with someone passing on. And we don't believe that we should express it. For me, I had to ask God why. I had to. I had to because I, and the thing is, he told me why. He explained to me why. He explained to me through the interactions that I had following my aunt's death. He explained to me that not all healing is physical. And that he answers prayers, but he does it in a way that he sees best and ultimately all things work together for the greater good right so it was like oh okay okay but if i had never asked god why if i had never allowed myself the space to ask god those questions how could i i that resentment that would have eaten me alive it would have devoured me inside because I wouldn't have stopped thinking about it. I wouldn't have stopped processing it. I wouldn't have stopped internalizing my thoughts. I would have, I would have grown to hate God. And that's what grief does to you. Grief can change you into a person that you do not even recognize. Grief can make it so that you lash out at those around you. That you hurt the people around you because you want to reflect the pain that you are feeling on the inside. And the only way that you can do that is through 
damaging something else. And for me, because like, because I had seen my aunt talk so vividly and talk so powerfully about God and the power of God, most of my anger was directed towards him. And I say this for the sake of transparency, but most of my anger was directed towards God. Because I did not understand how he could do that. I didn't understand how he could make that happen. But let me explain this to you. God didn't do that. He didn't give my aunt counsel. He didn't make her get sick. And I had to realize that. A lot of times we blame God for the bad things that happen in the world. We say, oh, God did this. Oh, he allowed her to die. Oh, he, he made her get sick. God didn't do that. And accepting the fact that God did not, God has no intentions, has never had any intention of giving my family, of giving my auntie, of giving me the worst type of life. Accepting that fact, it brought me some type of peace. It brought me some type of peace. And I couldn't continue to hold on to that anger towards God because I realized that what I was doing, and Danielle Brooks talked about it during the Color Purple interviews. She was talking about, and this is like a completely, it's a completely different example, but she was talking about how when the strikes happened and everything was going on, she was running out of work. And she was saying that she had crazy hope but not crazy faith. And she said something so powerful that I want to share with you all. She said, the difference between the hope and the faith was that the hope, she was just like, everything's going to work out for the best. Everything's going to be the best. Everything's going to be great. But for the faith, Danielle Brooks said that. Despite what happened, whether the outcome was good or bad, she knew that she would be all right. And so for my Annie, I had to realize that on some level, she had faith. Because despite what was happening around her, she believed that she would still be in the hands of God either way. And I had hope. I had crazy hope, but I, my, I didn't have crazy faith. Because to me, if she died, that would be the worst possible outcome. I did not have that crazy faith. And I realized it now. I realized it now that I didn't have that. But she did. Because regardless of her outcome, she knew that she would be okay. She knew that she would be okay. And she rejoiced in the fact. And I believe that she rejoices in the fact, I should say, that she is in the Savior's arms. She rejoices in that. That's the product of her faith. And accepting her death is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I'm still accepting it. Like, y'all see, I don't know if y'all could tell, but like a few minutes ago, I was crying because like, she dead for real. I cannot believe it. Is this real life? How is she dead? What in the world? I can't, like, <laughs> Like, is she, is she dead, like, for real, for real, or for fake? Like, this got to be a joke. There are times when I still can't accept it myself because I knew the type of person that I had, and that person isn't here anymore, and I have to ask God. I have to ask him to just help me because I don't know. And as I said earlier, it broke my heart, and a piece of me died. And will I ever fully... Heal from that? No. I will not. Not in the sense that I will stop. Not in the sense that I will always be ang I will I will continue being angry and um upset with God and all of that. No, I have healed past that stage, but the memory of my aunt, that's tattooed on my heart. And there is no 
that grief will never. And something I've realized is that with me, my grief, I process it. I used to process it by running away. I don't do that anymore. And now I fully process and I take the time to heal as much as I can. But it never goes away. Because there will be times when I will think about my Ani and I will cry. I will cry like I will bawl. But there will be times when I will laugh. And that lets me know that I haven't really healed from, I haven't really healed completely. I haven't recovered fully from her passing. And that's okay. And I know that I never really will. What will happen is that time heals all wounds. So eventually, I'll be able to speak about her without crying. Eventually, I'll be able to speak about her without my mind still having that question of, I wish, I just, I don't know. But there will never be a day where I do not miss her. There will never be a day that I do not think of her. There will never be a day where I do not love her. I love my Ani in perpetuity. Through the universe and beyond. I get that from the Whitney Houston movie. <laughs> she said, uh, what she say, man, the Bobby Christina in the Whitney Houston movie, the new biopic that come out, I love you through the universe and beyond. I will never stop loving her. And because I will never stop loving her, I know that I will never fully recover from my grief. Because grief is really love that lasts beyond the grave. And because of that, because I know I will never stop loving her. I will never fully recover. For me to fully recover, for me, I'm talking about me personally. For me to fully recover, I will have to forget her entirely. I will have to erase her from my memory completely. And I don't want to do that. Because a part of my acceptance is realizing that my grief is a part of me. But it does not tell the story of my life. Yes, my grief is there. And yes, my and yes, my grief is great, but there is nothing that God cannot overcome. And so I'm realizing that God is capable of doing all things. And where I used to cry for hours at a time, I, now I only cry for minutes. And He has made it in such a way, whereas that hole that she that was left in my heart, He fills it with the memories of her. So yes, God knows my pain, but he also provides relief. He provides me relief from my grief. Now, for some people, some people can recover from grief. Some people can recover from grief. Absolutely. I believe they can. But for me, nah, buddy. That, that becomes a part of me. And not to say that it weighs me down, but that grief, that love, it's something I never forget. I never forget it. And I carry it with me wherever I go. Not the negative aspect of it. Not the hurt and the pain. But I carry with it, carry with me the love, the memories, the peace and the kindness and the treasured heart that my aunt had. That's a part of my grief. That is a part of my love, remembering those things. And so I will not forget that. And I will not let go of that. And I will hold on to that. I will hold on to that love. I will hold on to that peace and that kindness that she carried with me because it's my way of remembering her. And it even... I've accepted her death. I've accepted the fact that my Ani is dead. I've accepted that. And I cannot change it, nor would I change it, because she is in a much better place. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for all the money in the world. But with that being said, that still doesn't mean that I'm going to stop loving her. 
it still doesn't mean that just because her body's in a casket and her spirit's in the sky, it doesn't mean that there's going to be some sudden drift between us and I'm going to start detaching myself from her and I won't feel the sadness and the tears won't flow from my eyes and I won't think of her anymore. I will. I always will. Forever and ever and ever I will. And that's how I know that she, her spirit, carried a light. That's how I know that she had something special because when I think of her, I think of the fact that God gives joy in so many ways. And she was the one of the ways in which he gave joy. She was one of the ways in which he gave peace. So I will never forget that. I truly and utterly, for as long as I live, my question is no longer, darling, why did you say goodbye? But now it's transformed into a statement. Darling, I love you forever. Yes, yes, yes. I love her forever. Well, this is the end of season one of my podcast. Darling, I'm depressed again. Don't tell my mother. Y'all, once again, I just want to say thank you so much for sticking with me. Thank you so much for listening to me and my craziness and my frustration and my anger and my pain and my hurt. Thank you all so much for considering me for even taking the chance. If you listen to a minute or you listen to 30, I love you. And thank you so much for just doing that. You all have no idea what it means to me. I started this podcast as a way to connect to people, to reach people that I never knew I could reach, to touch people in ways I never knew that they could be touched on. I wanted to do something that would matter, something that would make a difference. So doing this for y'all has been and is one of the greater privileges of my life. Now, don't worry. We will be back next season for more, more stories, more crying, more laughter, (laughs) and more of everything. But until then, my name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr., and this has been Season 1 of Darling, I'm Depressed Again. Don't tell my mother. Until next time.